Mile 40 is rocking and rolling. We are back. Um, and again, just a note of gratitude to everybody out there as we make it through the holiday season. Um, you know, I really appreciate all the feedback that you guys have shared with regards to uh, the podcast so far and the season. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, a special note goes out to all the guests that have been on that have shared their individual stories, their backgrounds that have been you know, extremely vulnerable and, and and taking the time to walk listeners through their learnings. As you all know, the focus here is to really narrow in on those pit to peak moments in life. And today's guest, um, you know, has a lot to share. He came to New York with $5,000 in his pocket and a one-way ticket. Um, initially, he came in with the ambition to be a fitness model. And as he'll tell us, things took a turn. Today's guest is Trevor Franklin. Trevor, thank you for coming on board. Hello. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I could already tell this is going to be a feel good story. Um, everybody, um, you know, turns their ear to that story about that person that moves to New York with big city ambitions um, and, um, you know, likes to pick up on how did you make things happen? So let's start from the beginning. Where'd you grow up? So I grew up in Lubbock, Texas. Um, it's like West Texas. It's like, you know, Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio are like the fun parts of Texas. I'm about six hours Northwest from all that, like okay. right below Oklahoma. So it's kind of out there in the middle of nowhere almost. And what was life like growing up out there? Honestly, life was great. Um, it, I grew up in a very small town suburb outside of Lubbock. So Lubbock has about 200,000 people or so. I grew up in shallow water, which is just you know, a little suburb of that. And it had about 2000 people. And you know, I don't know how many people that listen to this grew up in small towns, but I personally loved it. I mean, I was able to play six sports growing up. Like me and all my friends would play pickup football in my front yard. You know, it was a deal where it was a tight knit community, very close, you know, doors are left unlocked, like that kind of situation that you don't see as much, especially like in the Northeast, I feel like. Um, but it's definitely something that I look back and have very fond memories of. It's just, uh, you know, I wanted more it is kind of uh, the reason that I ended up picking up and leaving. Got it. Got it. And um, we had dust this, discussed this before, but you had dropped out of school at one point, correct? Yeah, correct. So I was about three years into a four-year degree at Texas Tech University. Um, I changed my major a couple of times trying to figure out what I wanted to do, that kind of thing. And I got a call from a fitness modeling agency in New York City that, you know, they wanted to sign me, wanted to work with me. But, uh, you know, I lived in the middle of nowhere, Texas, and they couldn't give me any work. So I was yeah. like, well, you know, this college thing has been fun. I don't really love it or enjoy it. I'm tired of spending all my money on school. And so, yeah, just dropped out one day, bought a one-way ticket to New York and uh, just kind of figured it out as I went along. <laughs> wow. So that's... that's uh, So for the record, I didn't know that's what led to the one-way ticket. I was just kind of trying yeah. to work backwards here. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about how we got there with regards to... Were you pitching yourself um, as a fitness model at that point? Yeah. So it's... <sighs> It's kind of an interesting way that it happened. I had a friend of mine named Sean Alexander, who also grew up in Lubbock, Texas, and he got scouted by a modeling agency about a year before I did. He moved to New York, was doing the thing. And then his agent found me on Facebook or, you know, it was one of those weird yeah. deals where he called me and was like, hey, we could market this guy as well, like get him up here. So flew up to New York City, did like seven photo shoots in a five day period, loved it, fell in love with the energy of New York to those that live here. It's like an unmatchable energy um, for, for, for individuals and myself. I, I remember getting off the escalator at Penn Station and just like breathing in like an energizer bunny type of feeling and being like, I belong here. Like I felt like I needed to be here at this point in my life when I have the highest energy levels. Right. Yeah. So after the seven day period, I sat down with uh, the agent. His name was Mike Lyons. He sat me down and said, look, we want to sign you. We want to work with you, but there's no jobs I can get you in Texas. So, you know, whenever you graduate, whatever, feel free to move up here and we'll, we'll talk. And I'm a very impatient person. <laughs> and so if we talk about more of my story, there's, there's definitely times I've made decisions just off impulse that yeah. have me in the butt. This one was one of those that did not, however. So I got home and I thought on it for a couple of weeks. And then an opportunity arose where my buddy Sean actually had a room opening up in his, his apartment. He was like, Hey, one of our roommates is leaving. It's open. Do you want it done? I walked back into my administrative office, told my advisor, I'm dropping out, took three finals that I think it took me 15 minutes per final, which it was me writing my name, like ABC, 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 walked out, like high five my teacher on the way out. Like, see you never. Um, Classic. Yeah. Booked a ticket for July 11th. One way. Um, took on 
two big bags of clothes onto my United flight. And uh, yeah, uh, I got here. That was really all. (laughs) That is epic, dude. Um, uh, Let's kind of uh, get get some more background here. How big was your family? So I have a pretty large family. Um, As far as my close-knit family, it's my mom, stepdad, little brother, little sister. So I'm the oldest, uh, but there were five of us growing up. Uh, How did that decision, you know, what kind of reaction did you spur making that decision? it was interesting, right? So I do vividly remember telling my mother. So quick backstory on my mother. She had me when she was 20 years old, sure. right? So definitely an oopsie baby. Um, and she essentially gave up everything um, to like care for me. Like it's it's insane. Like as I've gotten older, every year that I get older, I, I'm just more amazed at how she was able to care for a child as essentially a single mother for yeah. years of her life. You know what I mean? Like I never didn't feel loved, didn't have a roof over my head, didn't have food, right? And so one of her big things as I was growing up, she wanted me to get a degree because she gave up her opportunity essentially for me, right? Like she had to stop going to school. And so she raised me to get the education, get the degree, go work in a good job, like climb the ladder, you know, the the typical stuff that a lot of us were probably told. Yeah. So I do remember sitting her down and her, you know, being on borderline tears and yelling at me, calling me crazy. Like, can you imagine, you know, your son from the Midwest, right? Bible Belt, Texas, be like, hey, uh, I think I want to go model in New York City. <laughs> you know, they thought they, they didn't know what the heck I was doing. And so the way that I pitched it to them was all the money that I'm making right now, I'm paying in, uh, in school. So I'm yeah. net zero essentially yeah. per month, right? Give me six months, right? I've saved up $5,000. Give me six months of living in New York City. And if in six months' time, I have made zero progress, have no career plan, I'm not generating income, I'll move back. Yeah. Done. Right. Yeah. So I think I was jobless for three days in New York. And then I just started, you know, working full time as fast as I could. And we got to the six month mark. And I mean, I think even two months in, she yeah. she kind of knew. She knew she that I fell in love with the city. I fell in love with the hustle. Like I love the work. I love the grind. Um, and it's and now it's every year she's asking when I'm ready to leave, you know. Wow. Uh, which, you know, we're getting closer, but we're still not there yet. Um and so that's kind of the feedback I got. It was initially shock and awe of like, why? Like, what's yeah. the reasoning? And then once I kind of explained my angle, and I think once they realized that I had a plan in a place, I wasn't just willy nilly, you know, going to pursue this pipe dream. Uh, they had a little more faith in me. And so, gotcha. Pretty good. Um, talk, just to educate the audience a little bit, what's it like as a fitness model in terms of like, how does it work uh, with the bookings and and the pay and, and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So... <clears throat> how it works is the agency sets you up with castings, right? So I think the first casting I did was for Balmore bowling or something like that. Right. So you go to this, I think at the time, it's just these big boardroom looking places. Right. And you wait in a line outside the door and it was me, like 15 other guys that look just like me. And then 15 other girls that are like my counterpart. And you quickly realize you're not that attractive. Right. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. I remember sitting in these rooms and being like, that guy is so like, that is a beautiful man, you know, and same thing for the girls. Like that is a beautiful woman. Like, what am I doing here? You know, like I'm from Lubbock, Texas. And so it's weird because you go on these castings and you're put in a room with, you know, use before, you know, COVID times you would go in person. And when you go, there's like two or three people there that are telling you what to say, how to interact, how to react and what they're looking for. And you essentially have to be an actor. For yeah. anywhere from you know 15 to 45 seconds. You don't get a lot of time. And a lot of the castings are with multiple people. So they'll yeah. put you in a group of strangers and you have to act like best friends and you, you know, or you gotta act like your you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, or whatever with somebody. And so it was it was definitely weird. And you know, I did the modeling thing for probably like two weeks, like the actual literal modeling yeah. where you go to castings and you try to get booked and that stuff. I did that for like two weeks before I was just like, I was over it. I was tired of people, you know, telling me what's wrong with me. And like, they literally look at you like a mannequin, like you need to fix this, fix this, fix this. We want you to act like this. Right. Mm. And I hate that. Like, I do not like really being told what to do by people that I don't know. I don't like being judged like that. Um, And so that's when I transitioned back to my roots of fitness and got into the group fitness scene and really started like what I would call my true career. Um, And it's been, it's been a blessing because now I'm at the point where any, you know, quote unquote modeling that I do is just brand partnerships with brands that I love and enjoy. Now it's fun. Now it's more. Exactly. It's fun. I don't, it doesn't feel like a job. I don't feel stressed about it. I don't feel like I have to do it to like get a paycheck or whatever. Um, And so it's a lot, it's a lot better quality uh, of what I'm doing versus the, the grind of going to castings four or five days a week and just feeling like run down. You you don't need 
the fitness model, you know, part of your revenue now. It's more like it, it's it's the gravy, um, and it's enjoyable. Exactly. We love some um, gravy. So let's get back to the roots now. You know, in terms of fitness, clearly you were in good enough shape to take the leap. Um, you know, during your college years, how'd mm-hmm. you get there? And and what you know, where 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 was your focus from a fitness perspective growing up? Yeah. So, I mean, growing up, like shout out to my parents, they put me in sports as soon as I could run, you know, like I was playing soccer at a very young age. I was terrible at soccer. So they transitioned me to like, you know, baseball, flag football. Um, I'd be in little basketball leagues. Uh, They love, I think they just wanted me to get my energy out because they put me in like running programs at a young age. And so, you know, growing up, I don't ever remember a time where we weren't, where we weren't going to, you know, like baseball practice or football practice or going to a basketball camp or something over the summer. And so that just naturally transitioned into like more competitive sports as I got into high school. I mean, I played six sports in high school and, you know, that's not really a testament to my athleticism. It's really just a testament to, we had 400 kids in the entire high school. So they were like, Hey, we need bodies, you know? Um, And that's, that's what I really loved about the small, small town, small school vibe is as an athlete, you know, just building that foundation of being able to do a lot of things pretty well versus one or two things really well helped me transition into a better coach because I learned the fundamentals of almost every sport needed. Right. And that set the groundwork and set the foundation for how I train my clients today. Um, And so it was, it was kind of a deal where I didn't know how it would help me in the future, but I'm so thankful um, for everything that it led me to um, because it made me a better coach overall. And so, yeah, I played six sports in high school, Again, wasn't super talented at any one uh, college. I just played intramurals uh, because it was fun for me. I just enjoy competing um, at some sort of higher level. Uh, and now it's, you know, I hop into endurance competitions, different fitness competitions um, throughout the city and throughout the nation, just whenever I kind of get the itch, you know? So it's it's been a fun ride because it hasn't been, it's never felt like a job, you know? Like I was never that serious of an athlete. I just do it to stay competitive and to kind of keep my mental uh, mental edge. I love that. And it kind of made me think of something though, um, you know, coming from a small town and now being a trainer who is recognized, who's got a big following here in New York and um, who people across different segments of the fitness world, you know, know who you are. Um, you know, New York is known for a few things. It's known for for finance and it's new, known for its athletics. And right. And so like, there's a lot of good fitness trainers with New York roots, big city roots, people who kind of grew up in this, uh, in this world. And, and so, um, you strike me as someone who is confident the whole time and, you know, and kind of never doubted your ability to make it in the big city, but, you know, let's call a spade a spade. Um, what is it like kind of competing against, you know, some, someone who is New York bred, um, in your market right now? I mean, it was, I would say it was certainly a lot tougher in the beginning, right? Like, I, so I coached at Orange Theory for three years. Okay. So when I was coaching at Orange Theory, the initial consensus was who is this like cowboy podunk, <laughs> you know, coming to coach? They were kind of like, what I was getting at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were like, did you ride your horse to school or like what? I'm like, no, we have cars. You know, like we're a yeah. modern society. Right. Um, but yeah, it was definitely weird in the beginning because you have those automatic, you know, stigmas and thoughts about, oh, kid from the Midwest, he's like in the big city, you know, he's got, he's like bright eyed and bushy tailed or whatever when he comes in. Um, And so it was a lot to take in, in the beginning. Um, I mean, I, I was fortunate because in in the beginning, like I was so like broke, I didn't really have a chance to experience a lot of what New York actually had to offer. And it was a blessing in disguise because I just focused on the work, focused on the hustle. And I was so like this, like in my own lane the whole time, I didn't really have time to compare myself to others. Yeah. Like it really only got, I would say in 2019, right before everything kind of went crazy, that's when I was able to kind of lift my head up and observe other trainers in the city, other fitness professionals in the city and see where I stacked up and measured up. Yeah. Right. Because again, as a competitor, like I was in the orange theory world, I'd felt like I'd kind of conquered that animal. I felt like I was doing really well there and I was well known within the Orange Theory community. But then you start hearing about, you know, these berries instructors, these Peloton instructors, these Rumble instructors. And so I started taking classes and I wanted to, comp- you know, I would compare myself obviously from an unbiased perspective yeah. about how how I matched up against a lot of them. Um, and it was a blast. I remember, I remember taking Eric Wilson's berries class and being like, wow, I'm going to steal three things that he just said. I'm going to steal, you know, different cues, different energies that he has because it's going to make me a better individual. So yeah. It was never like a quantifiable competition necessarily because it wasn't, you know, like a fitness competition, but it was a deal where I respected certain instructors and I wanted to bring what I felt like their superpower was in the room into my own product. 
Uh, and so again, I was blessed in the beginning by not even having the opportunity to see all that. And then as I started learning more and more about other fitness professionals, I kind of just tried to absorb what they were doing well. I love that. You know, you just basically surrounded yourself with people who were doing what you wanted to do, um, yeah. you know, in a way that you kind of looked up to it and absorbed it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that says a lot about your approach, but Let's talk about what differentiates you. I mean, on the outside, I do see, you know, how you work with your clients. And I, I think your personality draws in a certain client set because you are, you know, who you are and you're, you're, you know, you weren't bred here. And so you provide that unique aspect. Um, how would you articulate your differentiator or your differentiation? Oh man, that's a good, that's one that I've pondered on for a while. Cause like, look, I mean, depending on how long you've been my, let's say you're my client, right? Depending yeah. on how long you've been my client, there's a nice balance of like me talking shit and trying to ruin your confidence. <laughs> and then also me coming to bat for you when you have like a huge PR, you know? And that, that's just like who I am, man. Like I, I, I don't, you know, I'm not like a braggadocious human, but I, I, I do pride myself on the fact that I've never tried to change who I am for anybody. Right. And that, 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 that stands out in the way that you train. Like, again, as someone who's kind of been watching your journey, that's very clear. Um, yeah. you know, you, like, you, you stick to your guns. I be myself. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the dark side of your fitness journey. Um, mm, yeah. you know, I, I know that you had kind of, um, been through a few things along the way, and we'd love to kind of dive into that if you can walk us through a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, the, the darkest part of my fitness journey, you know, especially in hindsight was I was utilizing anabolic steroids, testosterone, HGA, like basically everything that liver King did just on a much smaller scale of um, I was into, um, and you know, I, I, I get the question a lot of like, you know, why did you do it? What was the purpose? Like, would you change anything? And first of all, no, I wouldn't change anything. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful for the experience because I learned more in a six to eight month period about the human body, the hormonal, the necessary for balanced hormones. I learned more about that in six, eight months than I ever would in a college classroom. Um, and that I ever would from somebody that that does the bro science thing. You know, I've always been a guy who I want to experience things myself. It's kind of like the man in the arena vibe. Yeah. Like I want to go through things myself so that I can better articulate it to others based on a personal experience. Like that, that's what I've always tried to, to, you know, pride myself on, I suppose. But I did it because I was a product of my environment. The gym that I was training at in Texas, uh, that I started personal training at was a bodybuilding focused gym. When and was it? When, yeah. So it was bodybuilding focused. That's when men's physique, the, the men's physique yeah. shows were really popular. Like Steve Cook, Jeff side, they were on top of the fitness game. And I wanted to be one of those guys. And, you know, like we talked about earlier, I am not a patient person. So I went to a couple people that I knew that had the supply. And I was like, I want to look like this in nine months. How can I do it? They gave me the testosterone. They gave me the uh, the trend, the Diana ball. I did a cycle of that for got 12 to 14 weeks. And then I cycled on to test Winstrol and HGH to get more of a lean look. Yep. Um, and that's when I was trying to basically taper down and cut down to get closer to the show. Um, and then just weird things happened where I got a call from New York and I stopped all that. But, it, you know, during the experience, it was crazy because I, I naturally hold about 195 to 200 pounds. Okay. When I was about 10 to 12 weeks into my first cycle, I got up to about 240 pounds. Jesus. So your boy was thick. You know what I Oof. mean? Like imagine the Michelin man, but just jacked. Right? Oh, like, that's, that's who I was. And it was like the first, I vividly remember one time walking into my bathroom and like, like shirtless, like trying to like flex. And I didn't really have abs. And I was like, oh, this oh, is man. not okay. Right. It's, but I was massive. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I'm bench pressing like 400 pounds, you know, yeah. it was crazy. Um, and you know, the things that a lot of people talk about is, you know, what's the side effects? How's your mentality? Stuff like that. I've always been a pretty even keeled guy. Like I'm, I'm very slow to anger. Uh, sure. I'm not somebody that has random eruptions and I'm not an aggressive, I'm a very, I'm a pacifist, you know what I mean? I'm not an aggressive person. And so I never had like crazy dramatic mood swings where I was yelling at people or having, you know, quote unquote, roid rage right. or anything like that. Um, I did have really bad back acne. Uh, I would get random sporadic nosebleeds like through the night just cause I was so dry and wasn't holding a whole lot of water in my skin, I think. Uh, and my cardio was horrible. I mean, I'd walk up a flight of stairs and just, you know, feel like I'm about to go into to cardiac arrest, you know? Huh. Um, and so it was a unique journey, you know, but it, it's crazy because towards the end, when I was just on test and Winstrol and a little bit of HGH, like 
I just remember wa- I'd walk into a gym anywhere and I'd either be the biggest guy or the most like vascular, right? Have yeah. veins sticking out of just random places. And it's, I mean, it's kind of a good feeling to be yeah. honest, because you walk in and you feel like you're the alpha dog of whatever it may be. Right. Um, but it's not, it, it's not sustainable. You know, I, I simulate it to, if you're winning at blackjack in Vegas and you're winning, 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 it's great to keep winning, but you can never leave the table with all your chips. Yeah. So you might leave with a little bit, but you're not going to leave with all of them. And so when I cycled off and moved to New York, I lost probably five to 10 pounds pretty quickly. Um, just because I, I also changed my nutrition, my lifting cycle. You know, I couldn't, I, I could no longer lift for 90 minutes a day, seven days yeah. a week. My body wasn't recovering fast enough. And so lost about five to 10 pounds immediately. And then, you know, now I've, I've lost another 10 to 15 of that. And I, I mean, I feel way better, you know, don't yeah. get me wrong, but you just experience a lot, you know, it, you know, I, I do, I've had two surgeries because of the steroid usage. I had knee surgery in 2018. Um, I had some cartilage break off my knee and it's because when I was 230, 240 pounds, I was still playing high impact sports. I was playing volleyball, basketball, um, just doing a lot of different sports that my frame couldn't handle. Um, and then I had to get gynecomastia surgery, um, on, on my nipples. So there's a gland behind your nipples that when your estrogen levels get too high, it leads to basically enlargement. Right. Uh, most people just go through it naturally, just through aromatization. Sure. But I, when you increase your testosterone levels synthetically, your estrogen levels typically rise with that. And I didn't take a strong enough estrogen blocker, right? Because when your estrogen levels sure. come up too much, these these can swell and get puffy. And so my test and estrogen levels were too high, uh, yeah. and I didn't balance out the estrogen, and so it led to a buildup behind my nipples, like a fatty tissue buildup, and it didn't go away when I cycled off. And so I had to get the glands behind my nipple removed. Um, so two really kind of interesting things that, that came about that, that people don't realize. And it's funny, I'll get a lot of questions about it. Like, Hey, people that are curious, you know, they're like, Hey, I've been contemplating this. I kind of want to start it. What do you like? What do you recommend? What should I do? And I mean, obviously I don't condone steroid usage, but you can't stop people. And if you're really going to do it, make sure you have a doctor and also just understand that you can't just buy steroids. You have to get testosterone. You have to get a two different gauge set of needles for when you take it out of the little vial and put it into your body. You got to put a needle in your butt or your quad shoulder, even three to four times a week. It's like, it's a lot more work than people think. And I mean, I wouldn't do it again, but I'm glad that I did it because I was able to learn a lot from it. Um, and I, you know, you answered one, one of my next questions, which was going to be around like, do you ever encounter clients who, um, you know, ask you, inquisitively because perhaps that they're interested in and what your guidance would be. Is there any sort of withdrawal? So when you come off of steroids, you have to go through what's called a PCT post cycle therapy. And the interesting thing about taking testosterone is if you think about testosterone in your body, it's like a water faucet, right? The water faucet is turned on. You're creating natural testosterone. Your body's generating itself. When you inject synthetic testosterone into your body, that water faucet turns off right? Because it's getting testosterone from a foreign you know, place. So the body recognizes that it turns your natural testosterone off. And so the, the hardest part and where I hear the most problems when it comes to like hormonal mood swings or like feeling like bleh, when you have really low test, when you cycle off of your testosterone, you have to do the correct measurements of, of uh, and I cannot remember what the, what the deal is called, but basically you're taking something to return on that faucet. Sure. And usually it takes one to two weeks in my case, at least. So I do remember a week where when I came off, off steroids, off testosterone, I got back to, you know, doing the natural thing or whatever. I do remember there was a week where I felt just really tired, really lethargic. I don't think I worked out the entire week and I just felt kind of blah, you know, you just feel kind of lame is the best way that I could describe it. And it wasn't necessarily a withdrawal thing where I was like, Oh, I got to hop back on. It was more like, how long is this going to freaking last? You know, like if this is forever, I, I really messed up. Yeah. Um, but I experienced that for maybe seven to 10 days. And then I kind of felt like I was back to normal. And, you know, now I'm at the point where I get my blood taken probably two times a year, at least just to mm-hmm. get my tests and estrogen levels checked. Cause I'm always really curious about how it goes. Uh, and I'm back up to like 95th to 97th percentile for my age group. And so very thankful for that. I got really lucky that I did it at such a young age because my body was able to bounce back a little bit better. Um, you were in college at the time, right? That's correct. Yeah, I was 20. I think I was 22 at that time. Um, you know, it seems to me in hearing your story, you kind of went through this phase of um, optics, you know, being, you know, the key. 
uh, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was the steroid use before you got the call uh, to New York and then coming to New York with the ambition to, you know, be a fitness model. And now, you know, you've clearly transitioned to your roots and in, in, in terms of um, how you work with your clients and um, how you present yourself and, um, you know, you present yourself for who you are, not someone that that's jacked. I mean, we, we, we all know that trainer who like, you know, will blow you away with his bicep. Uh, not to say that you're not in excellent shape. It's more it to say forms. that, yeah. yeah, it's more to say that like, you know, I, I look at a picture of you and I can digest, you know, the person that I'm looking at. Um, yeah. and so my, my next question to you around that transition, um, you know, you had said it was about two, three weeks of fitness modeling before you had decided to go into, um, you know, training. But there had to be something going on on the inside as you were making that transition, right? Like there had to be thoughts running through your head that kind of uh, picked you up. And in particular, if there was ever a low point, low point, you know, in that in that process, we'd love to hear about it. Yeah, I mean, I think the low point for me was when I started this, you know, fitness modeling journey is like hearing people dissect you, you know, because it, it kind of dehumanizes you. Because they're like, we want you to fix this and this and this. And you're like, what are you talking about? You know, I've spent 24 years building this to what it is today. And you want me to just take a 180 for, for what? For the chance of working with your brand and getting paid in 90 days? Like, are you kidding me? Like, is it worth it? And so there was a probably a week or two where I did feel... I, I just kind of lost my purpose a little bit when I very first moved here. And I mean, there were a couple of nights where you just like sit in your bed and like cry. You're like what have I done? You know, cause I blew up my entire life in Texas. I had no clients. I had no job there anymore. You know, I told all these people that I'm moving. So it'd be embarrassing to leave, but I had to do some soul searching and like, okay, what is my purpose? Like, why am I here? And what am I trying to do while I'm here? You know? And thankfully that's when the orange theory stuff came about, you know, it gave me a purpose. It gave me something to focus on. It gave me a community and a group of individuals that made me feel like I was important. You know, um, and that was a huge shift for me because then I was like, I don't need this, you know, fitness modeling thing. I don't need people to tell me that I'm like good looking enough for your campaign or good looking enough to be part of your brand or job or whatever. And then it just becomes silly. You know, when you look back at it, you're like, that was such a silly thing that it, that it bothered me, but it was a weird shift. You know, I, again, I grew up in Lubbock, Texas, where it's like, I had a pretty good life. You know, like I had great friends, great people that supported me. I didn't, I, I wasn't around a whole lot of negative people or people that didn't have like my best interest at heart. And then you come to this brand new city where you're working with a very superficial, um, superficial industry in itself, you know, and you don't know anybody, you don't know their intentions. And so it's like, I think I had this, not imposter syndrome, but this syndrome where I was like, I don't belong. You know what I mean? Where it's like, I'm, I'm new here. I'm, I'm a foreigner here. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know who I can trust, who who's my actual friend and who's just trying to do their own thing. And so that that kind of shifted once I felt like I found a, you know, an actual home. That's great. And and one thing that kind of stands out about your story in particular and and not to kind of keep going back and forth, but just in hearing you say that is when we had discussed your bout with steroids and and this is for the listeners out there, you know, it, it's not necessarily it wasn't positioned as a pit the way that Trevor positions it as a he was grateful for it B it was more of a learning experience and now he uses with regards to how he works with his own clientele and so a lot of times on this podcast we talk about these experiences and we talk about how you know they were extreme you know low points and and kind of things were dark and sullen and and all that but a lot of times you know what we could do is we could reframe those moments and kind of be open to the fact that we are going to go through bouts in our life where uh, we may make errors in judgment. We may do things that, you know, as we're older, we look back and we're like, how did we end up there? Uh, but if we approach those moments as opportunities uh, to learn and, and to your point, that idea of um, experiencing things on your own in order to be able to speak about them speaks volumes um, and, and really um, amplifies your authenticity uh, when you are working with clients on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so from there, when you were at Orange Theory, and now you started to kind of find your, your legs underneath you, clearly a lot has happened since then. Um, let's talk about that growth and, and, and how that kind of went. Yeah. Um, 
And that's something I've actually sat and pondered on a lot because my life has taken a dramatically different direction post 2020. Um, and like, this is sad to say, but like COVID was the best thing to happen in my business. It was wild. Um, it, it's weird because I had left Orange Theory to kind of go to Performance House and kind of start my own thing and branch off into one-on-one training in a whole new group fitness class setting. That was the end, end of 2019. Built out, had maybe two or three clients going into 2020. I was teaching like five to 10 classes. Like things were good. You know, I was happy. I was comfortable. I was doing well. It was fun. It was exciting. It was something new. COVID hit. Everything shuts down. And in the span of probably about a week, I went from having three to four clients to having 30. You know, um, it was a deal where when all the gyms shut down, when uh, all the group fitness shut down, all the commercials shut down, Everyone everybody that was I scrambling ever, for everybody was scrambling everybody, for a trainer. Yeah, everyone was scrambling. I know a lot of my friends in fitness just took a vacation because they thought that it was going to last two weeks. And what I did instead was started marketing myself as this FaceTime trainer. You know, like yo, let's hop on a FaceTime. We'll work out for an hour. It's going to be freaking great. You know, um, and dude, I remember I because my parents they flew me back or I flew back to Oklahoma. They got me back home. And I was there for like two months and I didn't take a single day off. I mean, I was doing eight to 10 sessions a day, just sitting at my kitchen table, FaceTime on training people, just ripping through, ripping through, ripping through. Came back to New York in mid-May when it was warm outside, had a kettlebell and a dumbbell, set up shop at Chelsea Park on 28th and 10th. And I'm ripping 55 sessions a week. You know what I mean? Hitting like seven or eight a day, training all sorts of new people that I never got to come around, not paying gym rent. I made more money in a span of six months than I'd made in the previous two years, you know? And it was just this weird thing where it, I just adapted, you know, it, there was never a situation where I sat down. I was like, man, how should I position myself? It just all kind of came naturally. I was like, all right, I'm just going to keep training people. I'm going to post about it. I'm going to promote it. And I was fortunate enough to have people that resonated with that. And I don't know if it's because I was maybe the only one monopolizing the market. Like I just got lucky. I don't know if it was because I built out a nice community at Orange Theory and they needed somebody to go to. But I mean, I've retained probably 50 to 60% of those clients. And now I operate off of referrals for my in-person. Um I'm at a point now where I'm pretty booked out with one-on-one clients. My goal now is to expand my online training business, my online training platform, uh, because it it has the ability to to handle a much larger capacity without me actually being present with with an individual. Um, And yeah, I I don't know where it's going to take me. I don't know what the growth is going to look like, but I know that I'm fortunate to to be around a bunch of people that are just great people. <laughs> you know, um, all of my clients are fantastic. I've been to like four of my clients' weddings. You know, they're they're more friends now than they are clients. Like yeah. they can never leave me because I'll they'll they'll be too uncomfortable. It's like a bad break. You know, they they yeah. can't leave me because I'll make it too uncomfortable for them, right? So I'm so ingrained in their lives. I'm gonna be there forever. I'm probably gonna be their godfather to most of their kids, no big deal. Um, and then I, I'm able to just preach what I love, which is the hybrid athlete training with running and lifting, like running fast, lifting heavy, looking good naked. Like that's my thing. That's what I love. Like, that's why I do what I do. And I'm able to preach that to my online clients, you know, so it's less personal, but it it still gives me the opportunity just to provide value. And that's, you know, when I do soul searching about why I got into fitness, like it's really just to add value to people's lives. Like I didn't get into fitness to be a motivator or to, to make people want to do whatever. Like I got into fitness to lead from the front, to experience as much as I can, and to just add some sort of positive value into as many lives as I can. Like that, that's why I did it in the beginning. Um, and it's just having to remind myself about that, that, be thankful for the growth, but also just keep fighting the good fight and keep trying to add value to as many lives as I can. I love it. Um, you know, you talk about your experience during COVID and and how that was a good time for you. I had a similar experience as well, where um, it was during that period uh, where I was able to find a lot of my footing on my platform um, successfully. And my question to you is, you know, did you take this uh, this um, scenario of chaos breeding opportunity approach, or you know, was it just something that kind of naturally happened? Like for me, I kind of went in with intent. I said. All right, the world's turning upside down right now. And generally speaking, knowing that, you know, when things are kind of chaotic, there's going to be an opportunity somewhere. Were you intentional about it or did it just kind of naturally, you know, flourish? In the beginning, it was very much a natural flow. Like, I mean, like, dude, I was in Oklahoma, right? Like, I had friends that went to Hawaii and Florida and they're living the best life. I'm in the countryside of Oklahoma on a farm, you know, like, what am I going to do? Go play with cows all day? Like, no. So, what I did, was I just started posting about the clients that I'm training, 
noticed I got an uptick in clients. And then I was like, oh, well, now we can be intentional. Now we can promote it. Right. So in the beginning, it was just me showcasing that my clients are hard asses and they're still working out, even though, you know, the, the world's going crazy, you know. Um, whereas as it started to steamroll and I picked up, you know, five, six, seven clients in a week, I was like, oh wow, this this is an incredible opportunity to grow my business and hopefully take that into whenever the world goes back to being open, you know. Yeah. Um, and it just steamrolled from there. Uh wow. and so then I became incredibly incredibly intentional about it probably a few weeks in. But it was just luck at the beginning, to be honest. So we've walked through your journey now. We, you know, we got a little hint into who you are. Small town kid, you know, dropped out of college, dealt with steroid usage, used it as a learning experience, went on to explore the fitness modeling world quickly. And now you found your, your niche in, in training. If you were to write a book, what would your title be? <laughs> oh, man. It, I would... if you, I, know you, I know I'm catching you off guard here. <laughs> But you can even tell me what your mantra is. If there's something that you live by that you kind of hold too strongly that defines you, you know, what would that be? Oh man, that's oh, that's tough. There's there's if I was gonna say mantra, it's run fast, lift heavy, look good naked. Like that's what I pride myself on, and that's what I built my entire entire planning training platform on. But it it's like other than that, it, it I would just say it's like. I'm like the dumbest smart person in the room, right? <laughs> because it's like, dude, look, I I don't know a lot about a lot, you know, but I know what I'm good at. I know that I love talking to people and I love being around new individuals. And in my and everybody tells you, so it's all about who you know. It's all, but it's like just the fact that I've been in rooms with some incredible individuals has led me to 90% of the successes that I've had and the journeys that I've had you know, and it's just conversing with humans, you know? And so, yeah, it's like a semi untraditional route, what I've taken, but I, I'm just like, so thankful for the journey because so many random things happen where it was like right place, right time, or just complete luck that have led me to where I'm at. That's what I bank everything on. You know, I love it. Um, I love it, it wasn't an educational standpoint at all. It was just kind of being like a childlike idiot 90% of the time. And then resonating with the right people is like how I got to where I am. No, you're spot on. And, and, you know, to me, the way that I would summarize this is you took the pen and you wrote your own story. You know, it, it wasn't written for you. Um, and you continue to script it along the way. Uh, Trevor, I want to say thank you for coming on board. You know, it was an absolute pleasure listening to you share your story, you know, share your wisdom, share the way that you go about running your business and um, talking about um, how you carry your clients forward and, and, and continue to grow within your industry. Thanks for coming on board today. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You got it.